Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest introduced to you now. Claire McDonald Liu is a practicing naturopathic nutritionist based in beautiful Brusselton, Australia. Originally based in the United Kingdom, Claire has experience treating patients in the national health services, private medical practices in the United Kingdom and Australia, and in her private clinic. A former environmental consultant, Claire retrained as a nutritionist following her experiences of using food as medicine to help her own young children overcome debilitating eczema, alopecia, and epilepsy. Claire has over 10 years experience in delivering ketogenic and restricted carbohydrate dietary support and training for weight management and patients with diabetes or prediabetes. She is a regular content contributor to Low Carb Down Under, the Nutrition Coalition, and is an ambassador for the public health collaboration in the United Kingdom. She most enjoys helping families and individuals to gain control of their health and weight with straightforward guidance, accountability, and resources. She is a co-author of the Sugar-Free Family online course, along with Professor Tim Noakes, Dr. David Unwin, and Dr. Peter Bruckner, all of which are former guests on our podcast. You can find Claire at www.leafy, that's L-E-A-F-I-E.com. Claire, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. How lovely to be here and um, to finally get a chance to meet you. I'm a really big fan of your show, Casey. Ah, That's very, very kind. I'm a big fan of your show as well. You do great interviews on your podcast. We had some real challenges trying to set this up. You were in Perth, Australia. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. That is not exactly the same time zone. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So we have to be either up very, very early or up very, very late. So I really appreciate you accommodating uh, the time zone differences. We were kind of marveling before we started recording that that uh, we're even able to do this to begin with technology in 2024 is pretty cool. So I'm really grateful that we get to chat. Yeah, me too. And it, I, it was definitely worth persisting and um, playing tag with you to get it, get it sorted. <laughs> and I just feel really lucky that even in a remote area that I've moved to fairly remote, that I still get to connect with, with people like you. And I have my own podcast now um and i really feel motivated when when i have these meetups and these discussions and these chats it's it's a really good way to keep learning keep connected yeah it's really fantastic as i look through your podcast and see all the people you've hosted i see a lot of familiar names and people that both of us have gotten to meet and talk to what has it meant to you to start a podcast and be able to talk with these people uh one-on-one well i think it's it's like i'm saying it's about me staying connected was one thing and learning um I really I get that a real great sense of um of uplift after I've had a conversation with you know somebody like yourself um or one of my guests um and I tend to be because that it's it's a huge time sink doing a podcast as you well know and um, so I do tend to be um quite choosy about the shows I go on and um the the people I meet and the people I have on mine and that's um it's really because I want to connect authentically um with with people I feel like are putting good work out in the world so I mean my main aim of the podcast was for me to do my little bit to help to progress what I think is really important metabolic health um solutions and options and real authentic options for people nothing salesy or spammy but those people out there in the world like yourself who are, who are pushing um really good choices for people and and helping to elevate that information because without those people that we're talking to without without these types of podcasts and these forums you know families would not be accessing super important information that really can make the difference to their longevity, but you know their quality of life. So it means it actually means a real big amount to me. So uh, I'm happy to contribute, and then you know have to keep learning. Uh, I love that. It's really interesting. I don't think there's many topics out there that would drive that type of passion and desire to share a message. Um, it it seems like this is such a message that is is so hard to find. And it's only kind of grassroots movements that are, you know, people talking about this kind of thing. But once this topic grabs you and you start to see the results and you start to try to share this, you can't really stop. And it, it, you're right. Like, it's not about selling anything or trying to spam people with stuff. It's just you really, really want to get the information out there in any way that you can. It's really an interesting kind of topic in that way. Mm, I think think you've hit on something there that 
Um, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to people locally or I'm having conversations and it's um, nutrition and the particular styles of nutrition can sound a little tribal, a little a little boring, perhaps, you know, when I'm talking to my uh, teenage son or, you know, they don't understand where the passion comes from. But it's actually experiencing the power of food. Um, I, If you told me maybe 15 years ago that I would be starting my own podcast and talking to people and engaging with people and going to conferences and talking a great deal about nutrition and what people could be putting in their bodies and how it would fuel them, I, I would have thought you were mad because it just wasn't a passion of mine at the time until I saw the difference in my own family um, and not just seeing the difference and it was you know, huge difference to, to me personally, to my family. But also I feel like there's a huge sense for me of wanting to work in this space because a sense of injustice. I feel that it's just not okay not to give people the, this information. And then they don't have to eat this way. Um, I'm not prescriptive. If, every, if, if this information was out there that you're putting out in the world and others, um, and um, people could make a choice to take it, leave it, try it, feel the difference, feel the energy and the better sleep and better immunity and um, better mental health now, as we know. Um, then, you know, I go off and do my painting or do whatever else and live a quite happy life. But I feel like I've just got, a, you know, on a, on a mission because I'm really angry about it. I feel we weren't given information that was fundamental to our children's health and and still decades and decades and decades after people have been pushing ketogenic diet for example um it's still you know people are not being told and people are still being dissuaded from these diet choices yeah that's a really good point if you went off and just did your painting that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world i complimented your painting behind you uh, before we started recording <laughs> before i even knew that you painted it it is absolutely beautiful <laughs> some kids on the beach absolutely beautiful painting so that wouldn't be the worst thing but you're right i think we have a, a bigger <laughs> kind of sense of a mission to get this message out there and this message for you did mm. start like we talked about in the introduction with your children primarily before it was <laughs> your own health that was a concern it was the health of your children that's right. Um, we we, you know, we lived in a beautiful area in England. We had um, our two children, um, two under two, so super busy. Um, and we were pretty healthy and we ate, I thought, really healthily. Um, made my homemade pasta. We ate pasta quite a bit. Um, had um, snacks. And then when I decided, when I had children and wanted to clean up um, our foods, um, I ended up making homemade treats instead so we didn't buy any junk or chocolate bars or ice creams or takeaways or and takeouts so I would make the date treats for the children with dark chocolate and all of those types of things it wasn't until later that I realized how much I'd increase their sugar load by by those you know 50 to 70 percent date treats that I was making thinking they were all natural but um I started to look into nutrition firstly with my son because he just had um, skin complaints you know lots of children do they have cradle cap a bit of eczema and it progressed and progressed he was really uncomfortable and um, summer nights when it was really hot it was just it was really he was distressed he couldn't sleep properly and um, I think it was we, we tried elimination diets and we tried natural remedy creams that people suggested we went to different doctors and different consultants we changed hospital and I had a conversation with I remember one particular consultant and I was saying right so now we have his hairs falling out in, in bunches. We have a, a, a alopecia. We've got this um, atacari, the welts so appear when he eats something or when he touches wood. Um, mold spores, perhaps, that was causing that. And then we've got um, eczema, so he's bleeding in the same places again and again in the creases of his elbow. Uh, so what you know, what's linking all of this and what's the underlying cause that, that's at the bottom of it all? And he was like, with, you know, with the NHS, we, we're going to treat this topically each one separately we're not going to look into it and we're not going to link them so try this next cream try these steroids and off you go and it was I suppose then it was just a you know a light or moment of like we need to get to this ourselves you know we we're not going to get to the bottom of it otherwise so did a lot of research and ended up putting him on what I called at the time a gut healing um food protocol 
and um, very much gaps in spider western a price in spider if you, you've probably come across those and talked about those types of approaches um and it was very much um really really great quality meat and um, stews casseroles but min- no fruit took away all those sweet date things that i was making um off off a lot of them um, what typically families would eat and it was very repetitive very few vegetables and um yeah within within weeks we noticed a difference and he's never had hair fall out since um you know everything improved within within three months um we were on a beach we went on holiday and I remember seeing him in the water and his skin was just glowing and it was healthy it had all recovered and he wasn't crying from the salt water like the last time it was game changing and it was the only thing we'd changed radically was was his food so so then it was just understanding um how quickly you can heal it was within weeks within one to two weeks that he stopped scratching his skin and then it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to recover then from from all the damage he'd done but it was the the itching had gone so so yeah off we were really fascinated then with um the power of food um tallow was a big part of our food journey we started making our own tallow um and eating a lot more fat a lot more red meat and it was absolutely delicious as well Ah, uh, that sounds amazing I, i'm curious like after going through all the different creams and potions and treating everything separately, like you said, what gave you the idea that the common link might be nutrition? I think most people wouldn't even consider that that would be the thing that would influence all of those things. What made you have that idea? Mm, I think um, that's probably a good point. I think I think um, we suspected food because it's what you put in. And I do think that a lot of families, when they've got something like an allergy or not an allergy, but an intolerance or reaction to food, um, you know, when you when you talk to somebody who's breastfeeding, for example, and the child isn't sleeping, I think they often naturally instinctively go to, oh, what am I eating? You know, I think there's a little bit of knowledge there that there's some connection to food and what we're putting in our body I think the dissonance disconnect is we don't know where to go with that because we've had such poor messaging and the wisdom of food has been lost so I think I think I had um, my husband too who's totally on board and he did a lot of research we did a lot of reading and then I think it was just we went I feel like we went down some wrong turns with what we looked into um, but it was it was having an instinct that it would be what you're putting inside your body could make a difference. Um, and we, you know, we were lucky that, that it had such drastic impact on him. Um, and we, we also were making skin balms for him as well to nourish his skin out of tallow. So tallow was a huge theme. So we we're worth treating it topically ourselves as well. Yeah. I love my tallow skincare products. Such a game changer really just helps your, your skin feel lovely. <laughs> We did smell because we were making our own, and um, we did smell like a roast dinner <laughs> most days. <laughs> well, I just asked a skincare expert who makes tallow skin products how you can make tallow products at home without making them smell. I guess you can kind of like she described it as like washing. Is that something that you ever tried with your tallow products? Yeah, and it's clarification, it's repeated clarification, and at, at a low temperature to preserve the nutrients as well. Um, so it, yeah, it depends how far you, you want to go with it and the equipment that you've got. And if you're being lazy, you'll just smell more of roast dinner, but, <laughs> but we definitely, got it. we definitely got it cleaner and, um, a, a nicer smell as well. Yeah. And softer as well. Okay. Lovely. That was a purely selfish question. I have jars and jars of tallow <laughs> that I have no idea what to do with. And I'm not exactly ready to smell like a roast more than they already do only eating carnivore anyway. So I really, I really appreciate that information. I love I love how you described like the messaging that we're getting and I this is so much your area of expertise is is the message that people get about food and especially when it pertains to um, ultra processed foods. And like, like I'm going through um, a seminar series that I'm preparing that I'm going to be doing in my neighborhood. Um, hopefully people show up for it, um, where I'm going to be talking to people about all aspects of nutrition. We're going to do it the same day for, for all weeks during the summer. And I, I'm really trying to be diet agnostic. I don't necessarily want to tell everybody they have to do the keto diet. They have to do the carnivore diet. They have to eat in a certain way. But it's interesting when you consider some of the things that we talk about in nutrition, you kind of get backed into a corner where there's not very many like viable options 
options of good foods that you can eat. And almost by default, you're kind of eating a low carb carnivore diet if you want to have really good health in so many different aspects. And it seems to me that the biggest antithesis to that is the ultra processed foods. So can you tell us a little bit about how we define ultra processed foods and why the messaging around these foods has been so poor for so long? Yeah. Um, so what is an ultra processed food? It's a bit of a mouthful. I'm not sure if families are using those terms. I think they're still using terms like fast food, junk food, sweets, cakes, you know, a, uh, a dietitian type world talk would call it discretionary foods. But it's um, foods that are in a packet predominantly. Um, they have labeling. Uh, if they have like health food claims, health messaging, they're probably trying to sell you ultra processed foods. So ultra processed foods have got generally more than five ingredients. They have ingredients that you would not be able to buy um, locally and you would not be able to process them in the same way. So you would not be able to replicate that, that product in your own kitchen with normal kitchen equipment so it's typically mass 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 produced um, through processing that we would not get to do at home with ingredients we would not be able to buy at home and often just pick up anything you, you, your listeners might be near uh, in their shop or in a supermarket or something that kids have bought home in a packet and you'll be able to spot ingredients that you just would not be able to buy but you wouldn't maybe be able to be pronounce and um we don't fully actually know what they are as well those ingredients i think i think that's the key thing in a packet and too many ingredients and does not look like the original ingredients so like an example might be corn is, is you know is an unprocessed uh, corn on the cob is an unprocessed food and then you move that on and you've got popcorn minimally processed and then you're moving it on to um, minimally processed, maybe a sweet, and then you, you go up and up the line to more processed. So then you're looking at a um, an ultra processed food out of corn would be a, a type of um, cereal, like a, do you have rice krispies or rice pops yeah. over there? Yeah, um, something like that. And then the um, the corn chips as well, and then you've got the um, fructose, the, the corn syrups and things as well. So. So that's an example of how we get an ingredient and then we take it all the way through um, extraction, ex, you know, extrusion and heating uh, and then baking. And then with the cereals and, and the chips, then we're, we're coating it with chemical crap and um, flavoring it and then, yeah, and then packing it sometimes with a nice healthy looking picture of corn on it to, <laughs> to show that once upon a time, might have had some nutritional value in it uh and then often we're adding we being the manufacturers and it's being allowed by the governments um they're they're then adding fortifying it with synthetic uh, nutrients and um, vitamins and then selling it as a product fit for <laughs> human consumption but not only that um it's um being sold as something that's actually of value to us nutritionally and the more and more evidence that comes out, and thank goodness for the researchers that put these huge studies together and it takes such a long time, they've been pushing the information that, you know, that, that really should be obvious to us, that this stuff is, um, is really detrimental to health. And it is, it's just, that's the key thing here, that, that um, we're in a huge wave of chronic ill health, metabolic ill health, mental ill health. And we've got fundraisers that are earning millions and millions of pounds and institutions looking for the solution everywhere under any every rock going. Um, but our supermarkets are pushing this stuff to us and selling the stuff that's actually making us ill, our children's ill and our, our mums ill. So um, yeah, it's quite an odd world when you take a huge step back and, and look at it. And your, your second part of that question was the, what's gone wrong with the marketing, the messaging and how, you know, how we've got to this stage, that, that type of thing. I, I guess really looking back um, from the 50s, the marketing was um, actually convenience food when it first came out. Don't know if you'll find this interesting, Casey, but um, it wasn't popular. It did not take off. It wasn't um, it wasn't 
as people often refer to it as a quick, quick, um, you know, uh, thing that people took to and women were so happy with. They, they were mis- families generally en masse were mistrusting of these new food products. So they they went to the the food, um, not the food, they went to the uh, marketers and the advertisements and they started to learn what type of messaging would work. And they sold convenient food products um, as better for families, better for the health. If you wanted to do the right thing, for your family you would take you know you would have these new gadgets this new equipment and this new type of food in your home and and they did a good job and it, it's and there was also and there is also the convenient element we now have families and how busy everybody is how busy we are for example we were discussing and um you know time we are time poor so um so it, it we've got to a point where it's very it's really difficult to actually unravel this now even when people know it's harmful, it's so culturally part of um, their upbringing, part of their um, what the work colleagues are eating, what they're having in schools, what what their kids' friends are having. That it's so difficult to unravel. It's almost easier just to put the blinkers back on and um, hope one of these major major charities are going to uncover a, a cure suddenly. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me, I when you. When you talk about it as like you you see the front of the package of of cold cereal is a great example. I walked through the cold cereal aisle um, about a week ago. I don't normally walk through the cold cereal aisle, but to check out like which cereals have the labels that say they're heart healthy, they're high in fiber, they have vitamins and minerals and all these things, you wouldn't the normal consumer is not going to flip that around and know how to read the ingredients when we have like 80 something different names of sugar and people don't understand the harms of seed oils and how these things are processed, let alone all the chemicals and dyes and all the stuff that goes into it. They just see the front and says, it says, Oh, this is heart healthier. This has this amount of fiber. That's a minuscule amount versus all the sugar and crap that they get. And then just to think about the addictive nature of that kind of food and how un satisfying it is how it doesn't satiate anybody it forces people into eating again and again and again and again and it just compounds the problem makes things so much worse yeah and and then like you're saying we're in that loop and then we have that disconnect with you with the chronic ill health and how how weights gain and certain diagnoses start creeping in um as we go through our 30s and 40s and 50s um, and then people putting that all down to aging. Um, but now we're seeing that children, you know, we, we've been seeing this increase over years, um, over, overweight children, um, obesity in children in America. It's absolutely you know, shocking statistics. And then we have um, other issues. We have stunting. So we've got children that are underweight and they're, they're malnourished, but overfed with the, these foods because the body reacts in different ways you can be malnourished and overweight but you can be malnourished and underweight in the UK and in the US actually um children are uh, um, not meeting their height growth potential so um they've, they've done studies and they've looked at this and children in some European countries that have a high meat and dairy intake of five oh no sorry seven centimeters taller than um us children and uk children wow. um and because of because of the quality of food i think that's a really unknown fact um i think we often put this you know often the public and often people think about this in terms of with sugar and processed food and junk food in terms of a weight issue alone but you know the, the fact that children aren't meeting their height potential i think so really it's really telling about the quality of what they're eating and and also the type of foods that they're eating and more importantly they're not eating and we've been kind of advised not to and then other things like um you know in america particularly but other countries definitely like australia's hot my hills and so is the uk like rates of diagnosis for for different types of conditions like um adhd and add um the prescription rate in the uh, in australia has gone through the roof of um people um having prescriptions for medications um, and that's definitely again um, linked to. I mean, they, they they call it linked to lifestyle. But if we break down what we mean by lifestyle, food is a major component um, of of those issues. 
Yeah. Well, I love how you've taken the approach of trying to help children with all of this. And you're right with all of those conditions on the rise at, at crazy rates. It's, it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's so sad to see how quickly all of these have gone up like exponentially in the last few years. Um, the ADHD, like you mentioned, being a, a big part of that, it's almost so ubiquitous now, especially like around me and you go walk around parks and there's litter everywhere and it's all snack foods and crap and a bunch of sugar. It sucks. Um, but this has been part of your crusade is to try to get this message out. And again, we, what we mentioned in the introduction with the sugar free family online course that you were able to do with some of my very favorite people, none, none less than Peter Bruckner, who's just a riot to, to hang out with. It's so funny. Um, he's, so he's, he's a great guy. I loved hanging out with him. Um, tell us about that online course. How has been your experience trying to get this message out to um, families in particular and try to help people reduce, at, at the very least, just get rid of sugar and processed foods? I think um, I think families have been my passion in this, and it's the area that most you know that I work with it the most because because I saw the impact for my two children, and um, and also because I feel that this is where it starts, and the next generation, um, you know, are coming through are really really up against it with with the, the additional load of um, increasing soft drinks and energy drinks and and ultra processed food and just junk foods. So in my my way of um, trying to do what I can as well as the podcast is um, um, I put together with my husband a um, sugar free course and that's um, it's quite simple it's free it's online it's on leafy.org as you mentioned the um, website so you can sign up and it just gives some um, some recipes some snacks and tips and we managed to get maybe around twelve people um, Dr Trudy um, Deakin and lots of um, others that you've mentioned, Professor Tim Noakes and Peter Brookler, to give their top tips and strategies um, for helping people to make um, these changes. So it's because a, a lot of what you can do, I think what puts people off is um, an idea of perfection. And that's definitely not what we're going for. What I'm I'm passionate about is to help people head off um, these, these illnesses, this chronic ill health and um, try and you know live uh, healthier and have that information um so it's about the swaps and the tips and the changes that that you can make um so that's that's some um, something that we've put together and then the other thing I do is I say one day no matter what project I'm working on um uh, which I like you know a lot of different kind of nutrition projects that I work on but I had to say one day for coaching uh and uh, I emphasize that um, I work with families mostly and I'm working with more and more families with children with diagnosis of um, autism or um, behaviors that are um, suspected ADHD um, whether they've got the diagnosis or not there and then it's absolutely it's it's I really really love it because of all of these areas sometimes you know you see change in, it's in people I've worked with people who've got off diabetes medication I've worked with people who've got off statins um, when I worked with the NHS which is awesome um helping them and supporting them but there's something for me really really special about working with a family particularly one that you know thinks that there's no hope and their child would never ever swap their foods and be able to manage these food changes there's something so really rewarding for me in working with those and giving them the support and tailoring it and and coming up with strategies for them and then seeing a difference in children's communication and their behavior and we, we were lucky enough to do one project with a school a special education needs school and saw really different types of improvements and and then recently I've you know working with a few families and and they're giving me the feedback that's just brilliant that their child is communicating more and um, able to interact um, and, and it's really different for different children. But, but um, you know, one of them that I worked with recently, the, it's that he stopped biting and he stopped being aggressive and he stopped having crying meltdowns. Um, so it really does range. But I, I get, I, yeah, I really, really do enjoy that type of work. That's amazing. I love what you said about perfection, where a lot of us in the low carb community are squabbling about what we define as ketogenic and how, how, is somebody strict carnivore or just animal based or meat centric and all these different terms, whatever. I, it's, sometimes we just miss the entire point that we just need to do a little bit better. And if you just go walk around a grocery store, or go walk around the mall or the airport, you see how bad it is out there. We could take little steps just to help that. 
I remember asking Nina this question. Uh, Nina Teichels, I know you're involved with the uh, Nutrition Coalition as well that she founded. I remember asking her this question a few years ago, and I want to say she wasn't disappointed. I don't think that's the right word, but she was just a little bit bummed out that like, like she'd started the coalition. She, she thought that by getting in front of, you know, senators around here in America and getting the message out that we could at least start to shift change and people would notice it. And it just hadn't really gotten out as much as she had hoped, I think. And so it wasn't that she was pessimistic or had wished she hadn't done it. It's just that she had done an incredible amount of work and thought the ball would have moved a little bit further forward. But I think, Mm. Again, that's a big macro kind of a scale, right? That's that's pushing big, big change. What you're describing is finding anybody who is willing to listen, any kind of family especially, to try to get that message in. And, and the joy that you feel just from sharing your message, not necessarily based on the number of millions of people that are receiving the message, but the joy in helping an individual or a family see that change. For somebody that's listening and is wanting to share this message, but they don't know how, they don't feel like they have a voice, uh, you know, they haven't started a podcast like you, um, what, what kind of advice would you give to a person like that that would want to kind of share their message and get it out there? Yeah, I think because I was in that position where when you see the power of this food and this change and you're feeling amazing and uh, I felt very, very lucky that we'd um, made these big, big changes to our children's uh, health. So I wanted to get the word out and um, I've tried different approaches. Uh, And what I would say to people is um, work within your own community is a great idea, but it really depends on your own skill set, where you are and what, what and how you can some people are very technically minded some people like to work behind the scenes um so they could uh, um, connect with a local organization and volunteer in different ways um so i work a little with local down under as you mentioned we have volunteers at every conference who just can give their time for that one day then other people manage the facebook groups of these different organizations that you've mentioned public health collaboration local down under and the Nutrition Coalition and the Nutrition Network, awesome non-profit organizations um, trying to help. So, so so you can connect in one with one of those, but but also within your local community, it's really great to start to um put education into nurseries and playgroups and schools. Um, and that can be done in a really gentle um way um rather than a sledgehammer approach because people are just maybe not there yet because they haven't got the education. Um so one thing I did with my local school in England was initially I um, volunteered to give some presentations and some talks. And that uh, eventually over a few years led to um, me delivering a regular sugar-free cooking club, which was so much fun. And um, watching these children and helping them and support them make, make full uh, meals and grow their skills and their capacities um, and try ingredients and touch ingredients and, and learn how to, to cook. Uh, and then you know, giving talks in the assemblies, giving information out regularly in the school newsletter, um, giving talks to parents and supporting workshops that were happening and events at school. So do, doing that type of thing um, could be possible if that's um, if that's within your comfort zone. And then within the UK, they have volunteers that take the information from these great organisations and then they write to their local MP pester power they rock up at the mp's office or they write to them or email them and they make it known that this is an issue and it's important to them and they want change um and some of our politicians are listening um it's complicated why why change hasn't happened i think conflicts of interest and the way governments are funded is a, an enormous part of it and just things are slow um but these organizations are making an impact so the the american um dietary guidelines dietary guidelines for americans and the conflicts of interest that um, the nutrition um, coalition found were diabolical there was one member of the committee with 130 ties to industry oh um taking taking money taking um grants um you know that the, they they did an enormous nina and her team did an enormous piece of work to uncover that otherwise the public wouldn't know so Australia are now under their review process and they have had to work much harder and be much more stringent about who is on their panel um, because of that type of information that's come out of America, because they know people are scrutinising what they're doing. So 
does, you know, these things do have an impact. And um, there were a few changes that have happened in America as a result, but not, not enough, to be fair. But but um, you can see why our guidelines and our star food health star ratings are so um, just, just they don't make any sense, basically. And uh, you can see why when you see who these um, the advisory panels are, are working with. Wow, that's crazy. Well, the nice thing about your response was that anybody out there who's listening can make a difference. They can do something. It might not change the world, like we said, but it takes all of us to share this message in whatever capacity we have in whatever way possible. Like you said, it might take some creativity, but there are ways that people can participate. So I love that message. Claire, unfortunately, because of our time difference, it, you are up way past what would be my bedtime and I need to <laughs> start my work day. So unfortunately, we didn't ever have yeah. too much time today, but we really wanted to make this work. I'd love to host you again sometime um, when uh, we can make the times work. Um, for now, I just want to say this has been a really, really lovely chat. Thank you so much for, for working together to make this happen. I think people will walk away from this conversation feeling very empowered and know that they can help be part of, of changing the world. But for now, where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work well thank you thank you for all that and i feel the same i'm it was really valuable to connect with you as well um if people do want to um find out more about my work and connect then um family health lab is my podcast it's mainly on youtube but we're on all of the platforms um apple spotify and um I, yeah i'd really love people to um, mainly to comment and uh, get get involved with that in terms of what, what they enjoyed and what, what they'd like to hear more of. That would be cool. Um, and then, yeah, if they want to hear about my organisation, leafy.org, um, they can jump on there and uh, contact me directly through that. And you found me through LinkedIn, which was um, was, was really nice to, to chat with you on there. It was really nice to chat with you on there as well. I love your podcast, like I said earlier. We'll be sure to link all of that, Claire. Thank you so very much for this conversation. Again, it was short but very sweet, and I think people will take away um, a lot of empowerment from this uh, from this conversation, knowing that you were able to make change in your family, and now the scale that you're making change is much greater, but it all started with just within your own family, and even there is a really good starting place. And so, again, I think this will be very empowering for people. I just really appreciate you and your message and your willingness to do this interview at, at a late time where you are in Perth or near the western coast of Australia. So thank you so very much for uh, taking the time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Casey. Really appreciate you and all your work too. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so very much for listening to and supporting Boundless Body Radio. This podcast is such a passion of mine, one of my favorite parts about running our business, and none of this would be possible without our incredible guests and listeners like yourself. Thank you so, so very much for all of the amazing reviews that we get on Apple and Spotify. Trust me, we read them all, and it means the world to hear that you are enjoying the show as well. I am very excited to announce that this summer, I will be hosting a nutrition seminar series. This is actually a project that I started after I became certified as a nutrition coach. I wanted to get a group of people together to discuss all aspects of human nutrition. And as a bonus, I did the whole thing outside by a pool, which was great. After the pandemic, I stopped hosting the series, but this year I've decided to bring it back. Each week, we'll have a particular topic and an agenda. We'll have outlines that include references and also meal plans, guest appearances, book giveaways, and more, all for free. For those of you who live in the Salt Lake City area, the seminars will be hosted every Tuesday at noon, starting on May 28th, and will run all the way until September 3rd. The seminar will be hosted outside, of course, at the beautiful Bowery Park in Daybreak, where I live. If you're available and in the area, we would absolutely love to see you there. If you are unable to attend, either that day and time does not work for you, or you don't live in the area, good news for you as well, we are going to put all the recordings and post them on YouTube, where you can submit listener questions in the comment section, which we can address in future seminars. I'm also including all of the seminar materials on our website, so you don't have to miss out on the content. My goal is to make a comprehensive yet simple understanding of nutrition so that anybody confused about how they should eat can create a framework for themselves based on their individual goals. As I said, if you're interested in participating, we'd love to have you. If you can't make it into the in-person seminar, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also our website at myboundlessbody.com slash seminar to find all the resources, videos, and a fun quiz. Either way, thank you as always for listening to Boundless Body Radio.